let me let me start with the introduction. Please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Dr. Rachel Ackeson, an astrophysicist and senior research scientist at Caltech's Infrared Processing <clears throat> and Analysis Center, IPAC. She is presently task lead on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, previously WFIRST, and on NASA's first all-sky spectral survey mission named SPHEREX. Dr. Atkinson's research interests are concerned with the early phases of star and planetary disk formation. She has investigated <clears throat> the physical and dynamical characteristics of close young binary systems using interfer it, try it again, interferometric techniques at optical, infrared, and millimeter wavelengths. Dr. Ackerson received her bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Iowa <clears throat> in 1991. She then went on to earn her PhD in astrophysics from Caltech in 1996. Following two years as a Miller postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, Dr. Atkinson joined the research staff at Caltech in 1998. Rachel Atkinson, welcome. Welcome to the Greenway Talks Online, Palomar Observatory, and thank you for taking time to speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. So for now, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, Dr. Atkinson, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Steve. All right, let me share my screen. And all right, is that working for everyone? All right, excellent. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the SphereX and the full name of SphereX is the Spectrophotometer for the History of the Universe, Epoch of Reionization and Isis Explorer. And that is quite a mouthful for a mission name. And so you'll understand that we all just call it SphereX all the time. So what is SphereX? So uh, SphereX is a NASA astrophysics medium class explorer mission. So that means we went through a competition with a bunch of other teams from uh, the community and were selected to uh, build and operate this uh, spacecraft that's going to launch in 2024 and will conduct four all sky surveys over two years. Uh, the project is led by our PI, Jamie Bach, who is at Caltech. And I have a few uh, little interesting uh, numbers to think about here. I'll tell you a little more about the, the telescope later, but it's actually a, a pretty small telescope, only 20 centimeters, but it's got a big field of view. And that's what we're really going to take advantage of. But the really unique thing is the spectral coverage. So uh, SphereX covers from 0.75 to 5 microns, but does it over 100 channels. And that's the really the new part. And it takes a lot of people to build even a medium class explorer at NASA. And uh, this is a little um, sort of fun chart of all the partners involved. So as I said, Jamie RPI is at Caltech and Caltech is also uh, responsible for the instrument development. So if you ever come to campus, the uh, detectors and electronics for SphereX are actually being assembled now in the, in the Cahill labs. Uh, at JPL, they do um, the project and management, a lot of the system engineering, uh, and we'll do a lot of the testing after everything is assembled. And then our partners at Ball Aerospace in Colorado, they're actually building the spacecraft uh, that SphereX will, will launch from. At IPAC, where I work, we're responsible for putting together the data pipeline and uh, the archive that the community will use to, to get all this great data. And then we have a whole host of institutions where the science teams comes from. I'm gonna tell you about the three science teams, that's, uh, sorry, the three science themes that SphereX is going to address. And uh, we have many uh, members of the community that are helping us to get that science done. Uh, and so a little host of logos there. 
So before I go into the details of Spherix, it's helpful to sort of set some context of, of where Spherix is going to fit and what we already know about the infrared sky. So the first all sky survey was um, uh, from space was IRAS, the infrared astronomical satellite that NASA launched in 1983. And that had four bands and 30 arc second resolution, which is really very large, but this was the first time that we really learned a lot about this part of the, of the spectrum. And that was followed up a decade and a half later with the two micron all sky survey. So this was actually based from the ground, but in both the North and the Southern hemisphere. So was truly all sky. And this produced um, the map I'm showing on the top right here. Uh, this is a um, color shaded map of the, of the galaxy um, in these three near infrared bands. And you can see two mass was sensitive, both the dust lanes that you can see in the galactic plane, but also a lot of stars outside the plane. Uh, that was followed by two space missions, Akari, which was a Japanese mission, and then WISE, uh, which uh, launched in 2009, but is actually still running now in the shorter bands. And that had four bands, and that those four bands produced the, the picture I'm showing you in the bottom right, and that's a, a color map of the same, same perspective as the one above, but now at these longer wavelengths, you see you're, you're much more sensitive to more of the dust, less sensitive to the stars, uh, uh, outside the plane. And so what Spherix adds to this, whoop, there we go, is all, so what all these surveys have in common is these are all in very discrete wide bands and Spherix is going to add the spectral dimension. So before we get to how we're going to do that, let me talk about the science that Spherix is going to address. So despite being quite a small telescope, Spherix is actually going to address all three of NASA's very high level astrophysics goals which are how did the universe begin? How did galaxies begin? And what are the conditions for life to begin? So I'll tell you about each of those uh, in a little bit more detail. So the first one, how did the universe begin? So this is going all the way back to the era of inflation. And Spherex is going to do a survey of galaxies to try to tell us a little more about what was going on in inflation. So as a reminder, inflation uh, is, is the theory that explains the extreme smoothness of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and inflation happened just in the moments after the Big Bang. And this theory works really well to explain that smoothness, but there are actually a lot of pieces that we don't really understand as how they're driving inflation, including whether there are one or multiple fields to drive that inflationary expansion. And so one way to get at this is to measure the departure in the fluctuations in this cosmic microwave background from what we call a, a Gaussian bell curve or a normal curve. And so the different theories of these fields have different predictions about, what, about this deviation, which uh, because scientists, we love our jargon, we're gonna call that the non-Gaussianity or in abbreviation, FNL, okay? And so the idea is Spherex is gonna uh, do a survey of galaxies 3D, and by 3D, I mean both on the sky as the two dimension, and then the third dimension is redshift, right, which tells us where the light is coming from in space and time. In space and, time. and so this survey has been optimized to study these inflationarily caused fluctuations. Um, and we're actually gonna have two separate ways of measuring this non-Gaussianity. And so looking at the figure, uh, this is a, a plot of, um, of uh, what we know so far, uh, what we can tell from the data so far. And so the dark blue line, it's actually a full circle, kind of goes off the, the chart a little bit. That's the results, the best results we have to date from the Planck mission, which looked at fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background itself. And as you can see, that's still a pretty big area that is encompassed by that circle, and in particular, the difference between the single field inflation, which is at the zero FNL, and all the multi-field inflation theories, which is kind of everywhere else, you know, you, we really can't tell yet about that. And so the other colored ellipses show improvements we're going to have in the next several years. So the light blue is a European mission called Euclid, and it is also going to do a galaxy survey. And their predictions are that they're going to be able to um, limit things to within that blue circle. But then the yellow, orange, and red, that's how well Spherex is going to do. 
So the two methods are the yellow and the orange. And when we combine those together, we'll be able to get to pinpoint this uh, as tight as that red circle. And so that's in a factor of 10 improvement, that red circle over, over the blue. And so that's a huge gain. And so how do we actually do that? So FNL is an easy way to think about it is it, it, it impacts the clumpiness of galaxies. And so here are two simulations in which the value of FNL is at uh, two extremes. So on the right is the value of zero. So that's the single field. And on the left is a thousand. So that's a huge value just to try to make the difference to your eye more, more obvious. A thousand was way off the scale of the plot I showed on the last chart. And so uh, in these simulations, the blue dots are galaxies and the uh, orangey um, light in between them, that's the, um, the, uh, the clustering light that you see between them. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to measure the, the clumpiness or the, the correlations in two ways. So the first is to measure the distance between all pairs of galaxies, and then to look at the distribution of those distances uh, or its power spectrum. And so the two, all these theories of inflation have a different uh, distribution for that power spectrum depending on this value of F and L. And then the second method is just to do a similar thing, but now with, with uh, triples of galaxies. And so in this case, we call that the bispectrum. And again, for every set of three galaxies in the whole collection, we'll measure the, the properties of essentially that triangle. Um, and again, the, the theories have different predictions depending on this value of F and L. So once we put those two together, uh, we'll do that so accurately, accurately, we'll go from the current best measurement, which is you know, basically saying F and L has to be less than about 10, we'll get that uncertainty down by a factor of 10. And so to do this, to get this accuracy, you really need a huge large volume scale. So you just have hundreds of millions of galaxies. So the second theme is how did galaxies begin? So now we're going a little, <clears throat> a little more towards us in cosmic time. And so now we're interested in things that started at the epoch of reionization when the first galaxies were formed all the way up to um, the present day universe. And here SphereX is gonna concentrate on measuring the total light emitted by galaxies. Uh, and the reason that uh, this is, is interesting is that um, the total light uh, opposed as to just, uh, you know, sort of the galaxies that, that are sort of the brightest clumps uh, helps constrain the dark matter and galaxy evolution. And so Spherics is going to concentrate on two inputs to this extra back, extragalactic background light. Uh, the first is called intrahalo light. And so this is basically all the light that we're seeing outside of the galaxies themselves. And so in the near infrared, we think that this is um, best explained in the, in the universe closest to us, meaning redshifts less than one, uh, by stars that have been stripped out of their parent galaxies due to merging or collisions or other dynamical events which have, have tossed them out. And so these stars are now just wandering in between galaxies on their own. And so that's one component. And the second component actually is a much higher redshift is, is the epoch of reionization. And so this is the phrase, this, this means, uh, this is the uh, phrase for when the first objects in the universe were formed and their ultraviolet emissions reionize the hydrogen gas. And so um, the hydrogen just on its own in the universe went from neutral to reionized. And this, this is really a signpost of when all, all the things that we know in the, in the uh, universe, galaxies and stars and so on started forming in large components. And so the, the pictures on the right show a simulation a little bit of this intra-halo light. And so again, it's a, it's a similar uh, simulation to the one for the clustering, but here now you can see the blue dots in the middle. If you're just doing a galaxy survey, that's all you're going to find. But SphereX, because we're gonna have so many maps of the whole sky, we can actually make a good measurement of all the light in between. And so by combining those, you really get the, the total light production. So the way this is actually done is to use all these spectral bins. So each of those two components that I talked about, the epoch of reionization and the intrahalo light, they contribute at every 
wavelength, but they contribute differently. And so what we're depending on here is taking an all sky map, or in this case, actually, it's gonna to be to get the, um, the sensitivity, it's gonna be just a smaller part of the sky as I'll explain later, um, but at a hundred different wavelengths across, uh, across the spheric band. And so as you see these fluctuations change across the different bands, you can match them to the two components, the interhalo light and the epoch of reionization. And so this allows us to constrain how much of the light is coming from these, uh, these stars that are, are outside the galaxies, how much are coming from dwarf galaxies that were forming during the epoch of reionization. And that will help us constrain the distribution of, of dark matter and also the, um, the evolution of the galaxies themselves. And so this complements the galaxy by galaxy surveys that are already going on and Sterex in fact will make use of those so that we don't have to redo that work. Uh, and this method is, has been tried on several other missions already. And so we're uh, taking up to the next level with these hundred spectral channels. Okay, and then the third piece is what is the conditions for life to begin? So we know that almost all of the interstellar water is locked in ice. And so when you want to understand where the water is, which is a necessary component for life on earth here, what you really need to understand is where is the ice? And so Spherix is going to do this in a um, kind of unique way. And that is we're gonna look for ice absorption in a variety of environments um, from background stars or from the young stars themselves. And so if you think back onto how stars form, they start off in a dense cloud of gas and dust, and that goes, undergoes a gravitational collapse. And when the center becomes um, massive and hot enough to uh, burn hydrogen, then you have what we call a protostar. But that's still surrounded by gas and dust and takes a couple million years to finish accreting its material, maybe make some planets and, and get rid of the dust. And so at each of these stages, Spherex is going to be able to, uh, to, to measure what's going on with the ice. And so in the dense clouds, we'll take advantage of background stars so the, the stars will just be uh, coincidentally behind the dense clouds, they're, they're not necessarily in them. But as the light from the star passes through the cloud, the um, spectral lines get absorbed by uh, the elements and dust in the cloud. And so you can figure out the composition of the cloud by what's missing from that spectrum. The same thing for young stellar envelopes, you'll we'll use background stars as they pass through those um, objects. But once the, the stars actually turn on themselves, they can actually, the light uh, goes through the, the remaining gas and dust from the central star itself. And so we can probe uh, those disks very directly. And so the idea is for each of those lines of sight, and this will be done for tens of thousands of objects, we'll get a spectrum across the near infrared. And one of the great things about the near infrared and molecules is it's got just a lot of lines from molecules that we care about for the formation of life. So just calling out a few here, we have water, obviously very crucial to life here on Earth. We have CO2, uh, we have CO, uh, we have um, a couple other molecules that are a little more advanced. And so for each of these stars, we're gonna get a spectrum like this. And by comparing the different spectra across those evolutionary stages, we'll be able to follow how the uh, the playoff between the different um, elements and molecules is going on, which will constrain, and remember this is all while, while these systems are forming planets, and so that will help us understand what materials are around when these planets are forming. So how does Spherex do all this? I've told you it's only a 20 centimeter telescope and we only have two years. And so I just want to highlight a few of the design choices that uh, really allow us to do all three of those surveys, plus some other stuff I'll throw in at the end, in just two years. So the first thing is Spherix has a really large field of view. So here on the circles, I'm comparing the Y's primary and the, the Spherix primary. So Spherix is actually smaller. We have, a, we have only half the diameter of Y's. But on the right in the, in the squares, that's our field of view of the detectors. So we have a much, much bigger instantaneous field of view. And so at any one moment on the sky, Spherix is taking in a much, much bigger um, spot, uh, 
patch of the sky. And so it takes us a lot fewer pointings to cover the whole sky. But then to get the spectral component, uh, rather than doing what all the other previous mission did, which would have just a, a discrete optical element at each of those band passes, we're using uh, a device called a linear variable filter. So these are bandpass filters where the uh, wavelength actually varies across the filter, the position in the filter, instead of just the filter letting through one set of wavelengths. And so the way to think about this is one dimension on this filter uh, is the normal spatial dimension that you're used to, um, but the other one is then wavelength. And so for every object that you see, you're getting the range of wavelengths at any one time. And so this allows us to not use any dispersive elements in SphereX and to really maximize the efficiency. And so now we need to figure out, given the properties of these linear variable filters, how do we assemble a spectra? And so this is a sort of little cartoon and it'll keep marching through as I talk. So if you don't get it the first time, watch it again. So we have two LVFs, so we split our spectrum from 0.75 to 5 microns into two ranges, and, and two LVFs handle that. And so we need to get every object to march through all the wavelengths. And so in an LVF, that means uh, changing where on the LVF it's actually hitting. And so the spacecraft is doing these little nods and the, so the little black dot that's going through each of those represents essentially one spot on the sky. And so as the spectrum builds up in the bottom left, you can see as we march through one part of the LVF and then the next and the next. And so it will take three passes through the LVFs, which are split in two. And so that's basically six sets of little spectra and those will build up the spectra in the bottom. And so we have to have a, have a fairly complicated observing plan to do this across, to track what we've done at what wavelength across the whole sky. But once we've done that, then we have this spectrum, 100, um, 100 spectral channels for every object that we've seen. So that's the third element is the sky survey. So to, to do this science, we actually have a two-part sky survey. So the first uh, is an all-sky survey. And so the inflation and the ices, the first and third themes I talked about, they really want just huge numbers of objects. And so for those, we're gonna look at the whole sky. And the, it takes us six months to do one pass of the sky. And so in two years, we can do that four times. But it actually doesn't take us, uh, because of that really efficient, um, and, and large field of view, it doesn't take us six months of, of integration time. And so we have a little extra time left over and we're gonna spend those in what we're calling the North and South deep surveys. And this is where we're gonna spend a little extra time uh, at the ecliptic poles or near the ecliptic poles. Uh, and that's what the uh, extra galactic background light needs because uh, they need a little more sensitivity. And so we build up the uh, wavelength coverage and the spatial coverage in a, in a kind of a, an interesting way. So this is after one month of data and then two months. And here you can see we've revisited some parts of the sky again. And then after seven months, we've done a full sky. So everything in the sky has been looked at once and you can start to see bits at the bottom have many more visits and then a year and then the two years. And so everything will be looked at uh, at least four times and some things at the poles will be looked at uh, many more times. Okay, and then the, um, the last point in getting the science done is, is point source sensitivity. So uh, SphereX has a smaller mirror than WISE. Uh, we have many more channels than WISE. So we're dispersing the light across many more spectral channels but because of improvements in optics and mostly improvements in detectors, we actually will be as sensitive as WISE in the same bands uh, here at around three microns, um, despite, you know, WISE had one channel here and we'll have about 10. And so we'll really be able to see all the same objects, but now be able to say a lot more about what's going on uh, across that spectral range. And so these uh, lower sensitivity bands, the, the darker symbols for SphereX, those are for the all sky survey. So this is how well we'll do for every object on the sky. And then for objects in the, in the deep survey areas, 
will actually do a couple magnitudes better. So in those small areas, uh, will really go well beyond what WISE has been able to do. And so that's just gonna give us a huge number of objects with which to do all the science. So in addition to those three science themes that I talked about, since we're doing this all sky survey, there's a huge amount of other objects that we're going, that are just going to be in the survey naturally. And so one of the important goals of the mission is to create uh, this all sky legacy archive that's gonna be available to the community. And um, you know, here are just a few of the things that we've thought of that other people are gonna be able to do um, with, with the um, data. So we've already kind of talked a bit about galaxies um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the redshifts from that. But uh, in main sequence stars, spherics will uh, have the spectra of over 100 million main sequence stars. And so that allows you to look at the uh, difference in spectra across many spectral types. Also um, evolved dust forming stars, AGBs and other types, planetary nebula, again, having the, the detailed uniform spectra across uh, 10,000 of these. So spherics isn't designed to look for brown dwarfs the way um, one way wise was, but we will certainly uh, see the closest ones. Um, and, and again, the, what spherics is adding is a, a very uniform spectral probe of all of these. And then we expect to be there to be just sort of interesting objects that um, uh, are very bright in the infrared that, uh, that will just show up as, as uh, unknown objects in the sky. So, um, and then the last thing I'll point out here is uh, the solar system. So, uh, you know, SphereX isn't designed to find uh, comets and asteroids like some of the other uh, NASA missions, but we will see them as they just wander through our field of view. Uh, and again, getting the spectra is a really great way of constraining what is going on with the composition of these objects. So just a little more about an example on a uh, data product. Um, and that uh, example I've, I've chosen here is, is redshifts because um, that actually is a, is a huge component of the inflation cosmology science case that I talked about at the beginning and really shows the strength of uh, the spheric spectral design. And so a lot of redshifts for galaxies are done in a wideband method where you just look for um, some of the big, um, so, so these lines, uh, H beta, H alpha, as, as the redshift increases, they change in wavelength. And so a lot of sensitive surveys just look for uh, bins of that. But what spherics will actually see in these blue points is we'll actually see the lines themselves. And so the, the reason that's really helpful is in redshift accuracy. So if all you're doing is in seeing how these lines shift across a whole big wide band, then you have a range of redshifts that that could represent. But here, spherics is actually telling you, oh no, in this case, the H alpha line is right here at uh, 1.4, you then get a much um, um, narrower range. So here the little inset sort of shows you these broadband here means this broadband redshift method. You can see that has a big spread of possibles as to where this galaxy could be. And sphere X is that, that very skinny line is saying, no, that redshift is whatever that will be 1.15, very precisely. Whereas the broadband for that exact same same galaxy would have said, oh, most likely it's up here at 1.5. So that's a pretty big error. Uh, and so Spherix is really able to, to narrow that down. And so out of the more than 1 billion galaxies that we expect to be able to detect with Spherix, we'll get really accurate. So better than 1%, in fact, better than a half percent redshifts for uh, over 10 million of those. But even for almost half of those, almost half a billion galaxies, we expect to get redshifts better than 10%. And so this is very important for that uh, clustering uh, method I talked about for the inflation because that, um, that distance actually isn't just on the sky. You also want to know that distance in redshift space. Um, and so having these accuracies really, that's what um, gets us that accuracy in FNL. 
but there'll be a lot of other things that will come out of this data that the community will, will be able to, to look at. So for instance, you know, do uh, the galaxy clustering because you, you need to know, just because you see a few galaxies together on the sky, you, you can't be sure that they're physically associated until you know their redshifts. And so again, the uniformity of the all sky survey is a big benefit here and that you'll get very uniform estimates of the redshifts across the sky. Okay, and so for an order for the whole community to take advantage of this, um, IPAC and the mission are committed to producing data products that will be made available in some instances very quickly to the community. So these um, will be in the NASA IPAC Infrared Science Archive or IRSA, which already holds all those uh, other surveys that I talked about at the beginning from IRAS uh, to WISE. And so um, people will get access to not only the spherics data, but will actually be able to very easily combine uh, results from SphereX with uh, Ys and those other surveys. And so one of the interesting things about using these linear variable filters is that the, the sort of first level data product that we produce will be fairly non-standard to most of the community. And those are the things that we're calling spectral image data. So these are uh, actually still have this, this um, aspect of the linear variable filters in it. And so even though it's two dimensions across the detector, only one of those dimensions is actually spatial. The other dimension is still this, this spectral element. And so you know, one of the challenges for us as the archive is to also create tools that the community can use to understand these data because normally people are used to getting maps where both the dimensions in the map are this, the um, spatial dimension. It's a little bit like some of the spectrographs at uh, Palomar where you, where you disperse the light in one dimension of the detector. Um, except here that you, you don't see this, you, you know, depending on the objects, you may or may not see this, you won't see the streaks because it's, this is at a given time you're seeing you know, just one wavelength for each object and we, we build it up over time. So one of the big things that we're gonna do for the community is take the whole sky surveys and create something a little more intuitive for people to work with. And that is for each of those hundred wavelengths, we're gonna create an all sky map or cube. And so to, to compare back to the uh, earlier surveys, so WISE has four of these at four discrete wavelengths and Spherix is going to have a hundred. So at a hundred slices across the near infrared sky at a hundred wavelength slices, we will have a map of the entire sky. And so we think this will be used by people if you're interested in say the water line or the CO line, you can actually just pull up this all sky map and see, oh, here's a bunch of objects that are bright in this line and go off and look at those. And so that's something that's really not been possible for the community to, to do previously because the wide band um, maps that we have from, from two mass and Ys, they just blur the signal from the, the spectral, spectral things in most cases. Uh, the, the other product, is that we will actually create spectra for many sources in the sky so the community doesn't have to do, the, do that on their own. And so for um, sources that we already know a lot about, say um, bright stars in Gaia, uh, we'll just go ahead and create the spectra and make them available for the community to use. Uh, and th in that case, we expect people to dive right into line fitting and, and doing lots of great science there. And then the last piece is those three uh, science themes that I've talked about. In order to get their science done, they actually have to go beyond these three science products here and create um, additional products. And those will also be made available to the community for additional things. And so the deep fields, they'll be uh, particularly sensitive maps made of the deep field. So sort of sort of mini versions of those all sky data cubes, but with a couple extra magnitudes of sensitivity. 
um, for the, the inflation cosmology at the beginning, they're going to have a catalog of a billion galaxies where they're going to just list out the redshifts and make those available for everyone to work with. And then also for the ice, for all the stars, the background stars and the protostars, they're going to make a catalog of for all those different molecules that I talked about, here's where we're seeing absorption and here's how much absorption there is. And so again, that'll be available for the community to just dive right in and start to do their own science. And so to me, uh, as someone working on the, the pipeline side, this is one of the most exciting things about the mission is that we're actually going to, to do these three very different science things, but then have data for the community to do so much more. Uh, and I forgot to say at the beginning, the, uh, the spectral images are going to be available within uh, a month or two of when they're taken. So the idea is to get those out and available to the community as soon as possible before we actually need a year's worth of data before we can do those all sky data cubes just because of the, the details of how the, the spectral sampling goes when we're, when we're going through the whole sky. So uh, the first major data release will have a set of those all sky data cubes. Uh, so with that, I'll just say, you know, it takes a huge team to uh, do all this. So this is just a subset of, of some of us after one of our uh, reviews and the team has grown since then. Um, and I will point you to the SphereX project website, which is uh, easy to remember, spherex.caltech.edu. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, I'll jump in with one. Uh, this uh, linear variable filter, and I assume that when you, you're tilting the filter with actuators. No, actually you don't, the way the filter is constructed, actually, sorry, let me go back to sharing. I think it would help me if I, um, okay, this one, let's look at this one. Yeah. Um, so the, the way the uh, coatings on the filter are done, the, the, the coatings are designed to do this spectral dispersion in the axis that we've chosen. So we don't actually, it's not like a grading where you, where you require, where you're looking, uh, sorry, relying on that angle to, to change the dispersion. We're, we're actually, these are deliberately coded in such a way that that dispersion is linear in one dimension across this optical element. They're really pretty amazing little devices. So they've actually, I should have mentioned, they, they've been used for decades by the planetary science missions that, that NASA has built and flown to other planets, but they're relatively unused in astronomy. And so this is actually the first astrophysics, Spherix is the first astrophysics space mission that will fly um, linear variable filters. They have been used in others, in other places. So we can actually, so we just, we, you, but because of that, so we actually have to literally dither the spacecraft. That's what this slide was showing. Uh, so we you literally- actually, You actually move the spacecraft rather than an optical element. Exactly, we literally move the spacecraft rather than the optical element, and that's and that's because to, to have a really efficient optical train, we want to really align that optical train and then don't mess with it. It's it's ironic, but it's actually easier to do because the spacecraft have to has to have that level of control for accurately pointing anyway. You're, you're already going to have to put those little propulsion capabilities on the spacecraft. And so this sort of staggering little steps is how you walk the source. So each time the source goes to a different, the little circle moves to a different vertical location on this square, that represents a different wavelength on the LVF. And so each of these little scans, that's, that's a repointing, a, a dithering of the spacecraft as a whole. Oh. So essentially, each line of pixels, <clears throat> excuse me, is reading a different spectrum in one right. axis. Exactly. And then the the LVFs are spreading out over enough that we uh, that to get all the hundred channels that we want, we have to march it through three times. 
Right. So this this same object, this circle is supposed to represent the same object. Mm -hmm. And that we go back and then after we've gone through, then we're going to march it up back to the top. We do what we call a large slew. So we have a series of small slews and then we have a large slew to take it back. But we actually have to you kind of do a little zigzag because you actually have to then get it over a little bit to this other detector. So the you know the plan is is really fairly complicated to get this all done and then to track how how much have you done these on which part of the sky, and so you know that's that's what we call our survey team, and they are uh, tasked with with keeping track for every part of the sky which wavelengths have we done and making sure in a six month plan you can cover uh, ninety eight percent of the sky, um, in all the wavelengths, and then we do that four times. Are these detectors liquid helium cooled? Uh, yes, these are H2RGs. So uh, it's it's not liquid helium, but they are they are uh, kept fairly cold. It's I think about forty Kelvin. Uh, so they don't have to go quite quite to liquid helium. Okay, so so it's not like the uh, you know millikelvin uh, detectors. It's it's something. yeah. Some of the longer wavelengths, some of those detectors need uh, much colder. These are uh, the same kinds of detectors that as will fly on JWST. And so we are taking advantage a little bit of the development that went into, into those. Uh, and so um, the, you know, we're not actually, we just have um, uh, refrigeration coolers that'll get them down to that, that temperature, no, no liquid helium on board. So does the coolant determine the life of the mission partly? Um, no. The um, right now, the life of the mission is uh, determined by the funding um, because we're uh, what's called a mid-ex. We have um, uh, a set amount of money that we're allowed to spend to both build and operate. Uh, and then what happens in NASA is after that two years, we can go back and apply for more funding to do additional operations. So, for example, WISE was also a mid-ex and they uh, did their original survey and then they went back and they, they continued to get additional operational um, uh, money. So we think the, uh, right now the estimates are that from the expendables uh, on board, it would probably be like a maximum 10 or 12 year lifetime. Was this an earth orbiter? I if you mentioned oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I probably didn't mention this. So we're in what's called the sun synchronous orbit. So low Earth orbit, that's the same kind of orbit that WISE is in. Um, and so we stay on the sun terminator line uh, because like a lot of spacecraft, we're powered by solar panels. So we've got to be able to see the sun in order to keep powered, but we obviously don't want to look at the sun. And so the spacecraft is always oriented to look away from the Earth uh, keep the solar panels on the sun and then point at, uh, you know, at, at any given moment, there's a, a, just a, a, a circle on the sky, essentially, or an area on the sky that is, is an allowed pointing, keeping all these other constraints um, away from the earth, solar cells toward, solar uh, panels towards the sun. Um, and in some, in some cases, we'd like to stay away from the moon, but um, that's not always possible. What is the uh, the uh, exposure time for each of the dither positions? Is it constant or does it vary? Uh, no, we, we want to keep it constant because the idea is to try to come up with a uniform sky survey as much as possible. And so right now it is just over 100 seconds. But that's one of the knobs we can kind of turn to try to make, you know, that, that that's a trade off between having time to go back and fill in parts of the sky if we have problems in our six months versus, uh, you know, just uh, having a, a plan that uses up the six months as much as possible, but assumes more pro it assumes no problems, essentially. So you could, uh, you could spend more time at the galactic poles to look deeper if you needed to? Um, right now, we're sort of balanced between because of these constraints of where you can point on the sky. So the galactic poles are chosen in part because uh, they have, uh, they can be observed a lot longer during the six month period than a random part of the sky. So right now we have it sort of balanced between to, to hit that sensitive sensitivity curve 
between the three science cases. So if we spent more time at the ecliptic poles, it would start to rob the all sky survey and, and affect its, its sensitivity a little bit. So the, the survey is trying to do that balance of, of uh, meeting the sensitivity goals of all three science themes. And the pixel resolution is six arc seconds? That's right, yep. So, you know, it's not as good as something like uh, WISE even, um, but partly we're counting on the fact that WISE will tell us where a lot of the objects are. And so if, if WISE has told us, oh, there's two or three objects in that six arc, arc second pixel, we will already know that that, that particular um, spectrum is gonna be confused. So, you know, one of the things for the galaxy uh, survey is, you know, they will have to do some vetting of making sure that they're, they're not, not paying too much attention to the ones that we know to be confused. Hmm. Is it already in orbit or when? I didn't catch when it goes up. It's, uh, we're, no, we're building it right now. Uh, and uh, the planned launch is 2024. So there will be some time for cooperation between SphereX and JWST. If you find something interesting in your survey, they can stare at it. Absolutely. We expect a lot of people to be looking through the SphereX data, finding the, you know, interesting sets of things, uh, and then using JWST, which is obviously you know, much, much larger uh, and can take a much more detailed spectra of a few things. Absolutely. You had a panel uh, on, on the one of your science slides that said looking for quasars with a redshift greater than seven. Do you expect to find many out there? Well, this is one of these things that, uh, as you can see, uh, there's a huge range of possibilities <laughs> there. Uh, and this just takes advantage of the fact that Spherix as an all sky survey isn't, isn't picking favorites. We're not a pointed survey that we have a catalog going in that we're only gonna look at those things. And so, uh, you know, quasars at those high redshifts are already pretty rare, but, you know, there could be some, you know, we just don't understand necessarily the brightness distribution of, in the near infrared. Um, you know, most of us assume that the ones that we've seen, those are probably the super bright examples but maybe that's not true. Maybe it's just that we haven't had enough sample space to say. And so, you know, that's why there's that huge range. We could see just a couple, uh, you know, we, we know we can see the, the really bright ones that have been discovered. Whether we discover a few hundred new ones, that's, that's the question mark essentially, if you think about it. But again, because we have this great spectral resolution, you can really see, yes, you've got those lines you know, at the right redshift. Other, <clears throat> other questions, other questions. Could I ask then, um, Dr. Atkinson, since you're involved with both, would you, uh, would you compare and contrast SphereX and the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope? So uh, Roman Space Telescope, uh, again, a long name, so we usually shorten it to Roman, um, it is more of a pointed mission than, than SphereX. So Roman uh, has a very similar wavelength regime that it's going to work in. So from the uh, long optical slash short near infrared, uh, Roman will actually end uh, at a little shorter uh, wavelengths, closer to um, to the K band, the two micron band uh, that we use on the ground. Um, but um, most of Roman's time is already um, dedicated to its science themes and it will do those through uh, fairly large surveys but not close to all sky. And so um, Roman again will have a great archive that the community will use for lots of, of new things, um, but it won't have this uniformity that SphereX does. Roman has several different modes. It's got uh, a grism and a prism for dispersion. It's got several different filters. And so uh, there will be no uh, uniformity in the way that SphereX is really focusing on. So Roman will go much deeper. It's a, it's a two plus meter class telescope. 
um, and it will be at L2. And so it will have a much uh, quieter environment, I'll call it. Uh, it doesn't have to, it, it's it, much easier for it to avoid the earth. The earth is a, is a long ways away by comparison. Um, and it will do some amazing things, but those things are already sort of focused on, a, on specific science themes. Whereas again, we have our science themes on Sphere X, uh, but the way to accomplish those is to make a uniform map of the sky across these hundred channels. Uh, Roman will produce a, an incredible amount of data because it, it's got uh, 18 uh, 4K detectors. Uh, so it also has a great field of view, um, but it's really gonna concentrate on a couple areas of the sky, the galactic bulge, um, a high latitude survey. Uh, there are no plans to do anything close to an all sky survey for Roman. So, th so they're really, they'll add a, a uh, they'll both add a huge amount to the near infrared knowledge, but in but in different ways. Oh. Roman is much more of the traditional. Uh, we're going to point in this area, and and do this area for a while. Time to so. Well, very good. Thank. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Step right up. Step right up. Well, let me try another one if I might. Um, you mentioned you mentioned the the ices ices and you know looking looking for possible places for life to develop. In the literature, I ran across the term biogenic ices. What what what's a biogenic ice, and how does it differ from an ice that is not biogenic? So um, uh, biogenic uh, molecules are just the, the set of things that we think from our, you know, one example here on earth are, you know, necessary and or signposts of, of life. And so the, the other thing to remember is when astronomers say ices, we're not just talking about water, we're talking about anything uh, in a solid form. And so um, these, different ices, uh, uh, there we go. So, oh, here we go. Uh, so we're going to be sensitive, not just to water ice, like we think of here, but also you know, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, all these other more complicated molecules, they all, depending on the conditions, and particularly the temperature of where they are, can be either in an ice or in a gas phase. So, you know, things don't, don't get to liquid phase until you have the density like they would be on the surface of a planet. So the two things that we really care about are ice and gas phase. And so um, the biogenics part is, you know, water is one, CO is one, because CO often participates in these chemical reactions that we see in life on Earth. And so it, it's just a term sort of for molecules of interest I would say, if you are looking for life or signposts of life. Well, thank, thank you for that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a history major, so I can ask questions like that. Um, Steve, Steve Cooperman, uh, if I got the name right, asked about, again, about the lifetime of the mission. I think, I think we could, could we go over that again? Sure, so what we're funded for, um, because the way these competitive missions work is uh, we actually have a really strict amount of money that we're allowed to spend. And we have to budget that both for building and testing the whole spacecraft and for the operations that will get the science that we've told NASA. So when we competed to get SphereX, we actually, um, these three science teams were what we said, we, we the SphereX team committed, we would do these science we would do this science. So not just the observations, but actually the, the analysis and everything. And so the, the two years that we um, selected is because that's the data that we think is actually needed in order to get those three science questions answered. And so the funding is very carefully planned to meet that. But the spacecraft is being built and the um, expendables are such that, you know, our best guess at this point is roughly around 10 years if someone, assuming NASA, the most likely candidate, you know, gave us a, enough money to keep operating. 
after the first two years. And there is actually a process within NASA to ask for that money after you've launched and, and shown that the, the spacecraft does work. And so the, you know, one of the main things is, is it does take fuel to do all that fancy dithering to, to construct these spectra, for instance. And what does it cost per year to operate this uh, spacecraft? Uh, you know, that's a good question that I do not have the answer off the top of my head. We have been dealing with the, the budget as a whole, and I actually don't have the breakdown per year. I can tell you that the whole uh, building, testing, and running it for two years uh, without the launch vehicle is around $250 million. A bargain. Absolutely. That's what we think. <laughs> Well, thank you. Jim, Jim Nordhausen asked, uh, are the detectors CMOS or something else? They are uh, H2RG, which is, um, hmm, someone might have to help me out here. Andy, I saw you were on earlier. Mercury, um, um, yeah, I forgot what they are. Someone's going to have to Google that one for me. They're made by Teledyne. Um, they are uh, the infrared detectors uh, developed for uh, JWST. They're not CMOS. I do know that. Did you say HGRB? H2RG. H2RG. Oh, yeah, with such a small pixel size, I figured they weren't bolometers. No, these are sort of form factors like uh, like optical CCDs and that you have pixels on a regular grid all uh, butted up against each other. I suspect everybody is Googling like mad at the moment. <laughs> everybody except me, of course. Um, while that's going on, I guess if I could Kind of ask a very general kind of question. <clears throat> um, the first date I ran into was December 19th, 2014. That was apparently the first mission proposal, first CRX mission proposal. Yeah, so that's a, um, a an interesting history story. So in general, it takes uh, a, a a fair number of years to get these mission proposals developed and to convince NASA that you're the one. So I, I told you that SphereX is a medium um, explorer, a mid-X. So NASA has another category, which is uh, smaller costs called small explorers or SMEX, because you know NASA loves its acronyms. Um, and so the first proposals for SphereX was actually in this smaller category. Uh, and it went all the way to the final competition and was not selected. And so one of the criticisms or, or feedback from that first competition was that it, they felt that, that Spherix was, was really pushing the boundary of what you could do with that amount of money. And so the team re-competed, um, but in the, in the larger, in the next category up in this mid-X. And so um, things got a little larger. We got uh, some more technical margin. Uh, we expanded uh, the data products made available to the community. And so uh, that was the 2016 round, and that's when SureX was selected. Which, that's an interesting process. And I guess, I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious as as the mission developed over time as as you know as was given better definition we've got three science themes cosmic inflation galaxy formation and interstellar biogenic isis um i guess it's not obvious well it's not obvious to me I, I don't really understand the synergy, the, the relationship 
between yeah so I, I yeah so the so the relationship is that each of those was limited by the um, precursor surveys that I talked about where everything was wide band and so what they have in common is that they would hugely benefit from the idea of in two cases of all sky and in the galaxy evolution you know a, a fraction of the sky but where you have these really uniform sampling at higher spectral resolution. And there are other science cases too that could have been made. Um, and you know, different parts drive things. Uh, I'll say for instance, that it's the ices that are driving the detectors to go to five microns. If we were only doing the first two science cases, we could cut the wavelength off a little sooner because you're not, where you're really gaining at these longer wavelengths is all these other lines that are shown here, all these other molecules out at four and five, between four and five microns. And so different aspects of the science push the mission in different ways, but they each have this fundamental idea that you want a really large sample of objects with, with medium spectral resolution done in a very uniform way. And so this idea of a survey, and that's where the, the idea of the survey came in. Well, very good, thank you very much. I was. I've been I've been kind of puzzled over the relationship, puzzled over that one. I think um, this is a common phenomenon in physics, Steve, where you have a a system with various capabilities, and you try to sort of sell it to the funding agencies by showing all the different things that can do this. This is. Uh, with all due respect, this is not a new phenomenon. This goes back. Absolutely. You know, you say, you know, th those first few missions I talked about, you know, IRAS in particular was revolutionary because it was the first thing in space and everything we learned from IRAS was new. Uh, but as our capabilities get better, you do have to sort of push on these different elements of, of either, in this case, we're pushing on the spectral resolution. We, we, we could have different science cases. Um, you know, part of it is what Jamie, the PI, is, is personally interested in. And, you know, he uh, has done a series of balloons and sounding rockets to look at this inflation question. And that's one of, you know, one of the things driving his science research. Um, you know, I come, as Steve said, from the, from the world of star formation. And so for me, it's the ISIS case that, that matches best with the science themes that I've looked at over, over my career. And so, you know, one of the things I love about Spherics is almost everyone I talk to has said, oh yeah, I'm really looking forward to this part of your data, right? And it's, it's really fun to work on something that a lot of people are, are gonna be interested in when it comes out. So yes, we, we could have chosen slightly different cases to help sell it, but I will say, you know, the final pitch, I'll call it, that we made to NASA, one of the things we really said was this bit at the end about uh, and here's all the things we'll do for everyone else, right? We, you know, we went through all the things we were going to do for the science team, but you know, we really did say, and just falling out of the archive, here's all these great objects that other people can go off and play with. If I recall correctly, I think it was Deep Throat who said, follow the money. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I, I greatly appreciate that 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 very enlightening uh, <laughs> in, uh, a, a, a approach approach to this, and 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 thank thank you for uh, clarifying that. Uh, could we go back to the biogenic ISIS a minute? Uh, I I got hung up on the biogenic part, uh, but and I hate chemistry, but <laughs> in general chemical reactions are notoriously slow without temperature and pressure. And, and you're looking at these, uh, these cases and there's not, a, you know, in an H2 cloud, there's not a whole lot of temperature and pressure. Uh, and you would think you would begin to get better conditions closer to the star going active. And yeah, so, more so energy to, support the reactions right but so uh in the in the dense cloud case you, you do have but what you basically have are ice mantles on dust grains 
And so it's not that we're seeing emission from the ice itself. We're seeing when the starlight comes by and, and hits that dust grain, a little bit is absorbed because of the, um, the wavelengths, the, you know, the light, the, the photon from the star hits this grain and loses a little bit depending on the composition of that grain, right? The sort of absorption things. Um, and then you're, you're right in the later stages here, the protoplanetary disks and the young stellar systems, you do have energy from the young star itself, uh, which is, it's good and bad in the sense that very close to the star, it's warm enough that these things all become, these all go in the gas phase and we're not seeing those here. We're seeing, we're seeing the transitions, the, the wavelength of the transitions change for these molecules as to whether they're in the ice phase or in the gas phase in some cases. Um, so we're, we're taking advantage of both of those cases. And again, by just looking at, at all the objects that we can see. So this, this dense cloud case, you have to have the coincident of the star behind it. We're not going to be sensitive on spherics to the dense clouds on their own. We have to have them backlit mm -hmm. in order to see this. I would imagine that with the, the young solar systems case, you would have a lot of background from the, from the, the uh, protostar at the center of that solar system. And maybe that causes some difficulty in, in figuring out what's going on. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. You have to understand what's the contribution from the young star itself right. and what's being absorbed from the cloud on the way out. And so that's part of the analysis that the science team will have to do in determining those final ice abundances. And so there they'll use information that we know about these young stars from, from other wavelengths to figure that out. And uh, Donald Lynn asked, what prevents SphereX from reaching 100% sky coverage? So generally in these missions, uh, we have to spend some time sending the data back to Earth. Um, you know, they're just sort of little um, other time drags. Uh, you know, we, in the, in the mission, in the survey plan, we just assume, we, we don't assume perfection. We assume that sometimes things take a little longer than you plan. And so um, because this is NASA, everything is very formal. We have, to, we have to say a specific number that we're committing that we can really, we're really, really sure we can reach. And for us, that number right now is about 98%. Um, you know, to get to 100%, we, we, to get those extra 2% just costs a lot of money. You just have a lot more contingencies. You have a lot more backups. Uh, and you don't really gain a huge amount of science. And so this is, again, one of the trade-offs in order to fit into our, our time and, and money budget is that we're, we're aiming for something a little closer to 98%. Is it more difficult to point the instruments at say the pole or some particular part of the sky and easier in other parts? Uh, it's, it's flipped. It's easier to point at the ecliptic poles and everywhere else is basically the same. You're just juggling these constraints of you don't look at the earth, you got to keep the solar cells pointed towards the sun, you don't really like the moon. Um, and so it's just this ever changing, you know, as you go, as we orbit the earth, and as the earth orbits the sun, different parts of the sky uh, come into view. But once you've missed that, you, you know, it's another six months before you get to see it again. And so, you know, part of it is if we have a problem, you know, for a week, for some reason, uh, you know, we can't necessarily go back and squeeze that in. We have to wait till that part of the sky is, is visible again. I mean, it's not far off the, you know, the, the nighttime visibility from Palomar. It's just a few more constraints get, get thrown in. But it's the same idea. You can't see all of the sky at night all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. What, let's, let's, do, let's do one more question. Anybody, anybody going once, going twice? Well, with that, Dr. Rachel Ackeson, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion. Thank you all for joining on a Saturday. If then there are no further questions or comments, let me conclude with a word about our next meeting, <clears throat> operating at Palomar Observatory, the Zwicky Transient Facility, ZTF, <clears throat> is a fully automated time domain survey that is being used to conduct a systematic exploration of the transient sky at optical wavelengths. At our next meeting on July 31st, Dr. Matthew Bram, oh, good. research professor of astronomy at Caltech and ZTF project scientist, will tell us how ZTF is able to identify 500,000 transient objects each night, automatically decide which of these are most interesting, and within moments, send out alerts to astronomers around the world. This is astronomy at an industrial scale. And Professor Graham will show us how it works. So again, thank you, Dr. Atkinson. And my thanks as well to everyone, to all of you for being here, for attending, and for supporting the Greenway Talks online. With that, I'll close the meeting and we'll see you again on July 31st. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>